This is going to be the overview for 1 Timothy. Now, what's our three applications? Historical. Paul is writing to Timothy and giving him instructions and guidance on how to be a good pastor. Timothy was a man called by God to pastor a local church that had been set up by the Apostle Paul. So this is a pastoral epistle. Doctrinally, uh, this epistle will give us the proper order of how things should run in a local church. Inspirational, we can find how to conduct ourselves and be an example to others. This small epistle has 113 verses, 6 chapters, and around 2,244 words. The author is Paul, and the Historical date is 63 to 65 A.D., somewhere around there. Now, Paul is going to address some problems to Timothy. He's going to address some of the problems that Timothy's having. And one of them is he's going to tell him how to be a young pastor who's pastoring older men. See that in chapter 4, 12 through 13 and chapter 5, 1 through 2. Number two, he's going to plead with Timothy to stay at Ephesus and not to quit. See that in chapter 1 and verse 3. Number three, he encourages Timothy not to neglect his study time. See that in chapter 4, 11 through 16. Number four, he's going to tell him, don't be too quick to put men in leadership. See that in chapter 5, 17 through 22. Number five, he's going to tell him spiritual exercise is better than bodily exercise. See that in 4, 8, and 5, 23. Number six, he's going to enforce the no women in authority rule. See that in chapter 2, 11 through 15. And the seventh thing, he's going to, you know, tell him to stand against false teachers. See that in 1, 6 through 7, and 1, 19 through 20. So chapter 1, he's going to warn him against false teachers. 1 Timothy 1, 2, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul is writing to Timothy. He is the Timotheus of Acts 16, 1, that you read about back there in Acts. And he says in verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and in endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. You see, some men have turned aside and started to teach things that are much different than the doctrine that Paul taught Timothy. So he, Paul's telling him to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And Paul is big on doctrine. He's the one that gives us our doctrine for today. And he's telling Timothy to stick with the stuff and make sure the men in his church do the same because these vain janglers, as he calls them, have no idea what they're saying. They will lead the flock astray. Paul even had to deliver a couple of them to Satan in, in verse 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander. And Paul says to Timothy in verse 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul admits he is the chief of sinners. And he said in Ephesians 3, 8, Unto me who am le less than the least of all saints. So he believes he's the least of all saints. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles. So he believes he's the chief of sinners, the least of all saints, the least of the apostles. In Romans 7, 24, he said, O wretched man that I am. So he believes he's a wretch. Being Paul's student, Timothy would have been humble if he followed in the footsteps of Paul. Paul didn't think very highly of himself. 
So most likely Timothy didn't either. And it says in 1 Timothy 1.16, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. When you believe on Jesus Christ, you get everlasting life. And I like that phrase, believe on him to life everlasting. You see, you don't just believe he existed, but you believe on him. My faith rests on Jesus Christ and what he did by dying on the cross, shedding his blood, being buried and resurrected. I've got my faith on that to get me to heaven. And Paul is making sure that Timothy is going to pass on the right gospel. Because there's some guys going around with the wrong gospel. He's going to make sure Timothy's got the right gospel and the right God. So he says in verse 17, Knowing to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So the right God is king. He's eternal. He's immortal. He's invisible. It says in Revelation 1.18, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Colossians 1.17 says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The only reason that everything continues to go is because of God. He's king. He's eternal. He can't die. He's, a, he's immortal. He, he can't die. He's eternal. He just keeps on going. There was never a time when he wasn't here. There's never going to be a time when he won't be here. He's eternal. He's invisible. You can't see him. But you can look at his creation. And when you look at his creation, you have no excuse for not believing he's, for believing he's not real. You know, the sun comes up. The sun goes down. You look up, you see all the stars. You see the moon. How does it just stay up there? You know, that shows you there's a God. How will this all get here? Verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So he wants him to take the prophecies and war a good warfare. In 2 Corinthians 10.4, Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You see, the weapons that we got aren't guns and swords. It's the Word of God. Take the prophecies of the Word and push back the principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Those false teachers going around. Paul doesn't want Timothy to wreck the gospel ship like these people have. And if he neglects the gospel in the book, then he's going to hit the rocks. Just like verse 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who Paul had to deliver unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Yeah, it's what it says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So he delivered them to Satan. He mailed them over to the devil, one day shipping. The devil had been waiting for a text confirmation saying they were at his front door, and they showed up. Paul had them learn the hard way not to blaspheme. Now, chapter 2, He's uh, Paul's going to instruct the young pastor in this pastoral epistle and going to remind him that God is no respecter of persons when it comes to salvation. In 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. In Paul's Bible Institute, he teaches Timothy that God's will is for every man to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But they have a free will, 
And God isn't going to force them. But God wants every man to be saved. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You see, Paul was very anti-Calvinist. He did not believe that God chooses some to be saved and chooses some to be lost. And he said in verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So this knocks out the Catholics and the polytheists. The polytheists believe in more than one God. Paul says there's one God. There's one God and one mediator. He says, in, uh, or John says in 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You've got the Father, you've got the Son, you've got the Holy Ghost. It's not three gods, it's one. These three are one. And Paul says there's one mediator. That's Jesus. He's our go-between. He is the reason we are no longer at enmity with the Father. And we pray to Him. And that's why at the end of your prayer you say, In Jesus' name I pray. This is anti-Catholic because we don't pray to Mary. We don't confess our sins to a priest. We go directly to God through Jesus Christ. You see how Paul's not just giving Timothy practical things. He's teaching him doctrine. In 1 John 2, 1, John said, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And in 1 Timothy 2.6, it says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Another anti-Calvinist verse. Jesus Christ gave himself for all, not just a select few. And now Paul's going to get a little bit more practical. In this chapter, you'll see how he even gets specific about how a woman should conduct herself. In verse 9 it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So modest apparel. You know, that means wearing clothes that aren't for the purpose of drawing attention to yourself, which is mostly showing off the flesh, but not necessarily. And the Bible does speak of certain clothes that a whore wears. In uh, Proverbs 7.10, it says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot, and subtle of heart. So there are clothes that a harlot wears, certain clothes. I mean, you know what that, that is. And he says, uh, the women ought to have shamefacedness. So don't try to draw men into lust with your eyes, or by giving him certain looks. For example, in Proverbs 6, 25 through 26, it says, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. A woman can look at you a certain way and draw you in. It says, For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. So that whorish woman, she draws him in with her eyelids. She's not... She doesn't have shamefacedness at all. So Paul says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. This doesn't mean you can't wear jewelry, but you don't need to let that be your adorning. Don't let that be the main thing. You should be more worried about cleaning up the inside and less on the outside. Just like Jesus told the Pharisees in Matthew twenty three twenty seven, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are, are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. A lot of people, they're so worried about cleaning up the outside that they forget about the inside. So Paul tells them in verse 10, about cleaning up the inside. He says, But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. When it says, Which becometh women professing godliness, that means your conduct needs to match your profession. Becoming means like suitable for or proper. Uh, proper for. You need to do the works that is becoming 
for a woman who professes Jesus Christ. That is the works that are a match for a professing Christian woman. So he says, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So you need to be doing the stuff that will match what a professing godly woman should be doing. 2, 11 through 12 says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So people like Beth Moore, Joyce Meyer, and Paula White are not Bible believers. They are in complete rebellion to these verses because they do usurp authority over men. And one of the things that makes this so bad is that it messes up the picture this is why I think it's so bad. Because, you see, a married couple pictures Christ and his bride, the church. It wouldn't make sense for me and you as the bride to teach Jesus Christ. He teaches us. Just, uh, just as it doesn't make sense for a woman to teach a congregation full of men. If she's teaching a congregation full of men, one of those men is her husband. So, you mean to tell me that her husband's going to sit in the congregation... And she's going to have to tell him about the Bible and teach him the Bible. That's completely backwards. The man should have enough Bible knowledge to be the one doing the teaching. It's like this. You should know so much Bible as the husband, as the man of the house, that your wife couldn't catch up with you on that ever. I think the man has a huge responsibility that he needs to know more Bible be the spiritual leader of the home, and she should be able to go to ask him any question about the Bible, and he's going to know it 90% of the time. I mean, there's some things you're not going to know, but on average, she should be able to go to ask you a question, and you know it, and you know the answer. But it's backwards today where the woman is the most spiritual person in the home, and the man doesn't care anything about the Bible. He doesn't care anything about God. He's just concerned with hunting, fishing, sports, work, eating. And that's it. So no wonder you got all these women preachers. Because the men are so lazy that they don't ever get in the Bible. And I know this one church, uh, the, the, if the pastor's sick or something, the men of the church are so lazy and don't know any Bible that they actually get a woman to do it for them, to, to uh, fill in for that pastor. That makes no sense. And you can't look at 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12 and say that that's right. It says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. How much more clear can it be? That's very clear. And it messes up the picture. If the wife is the consistent spiritual leader of the home, teaching her husband the things of God, that is completely backwards and sick, if you think about it. Me and you, as the bride, we don't teach Jesus Christ. He teaches us. And it goes on to talk about this further in verse 13 and 14 of chapter 2. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Another reason it's not a good idea to have woman pastors is because women are more easily deceived. And they get this from Eve, remember? You see, Adam wasn't deceived into eating the fruit. It was Eve that was deceived. Adam did it because he loved his wife. And he wanted to die with her. It says in verse 15, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. She shall be saved in childbearing. Now, this doesn't mean saved as in saved from hell, but the context is about deception. She'll be saved from deception. See, women go through times where they are more easily deceived, like when they are bearing a child. And they can be saved from deception by continuing in faith. Faith in what? The scriptures. In, uh, continuing in charity. Putting others before themselves. When you put others before themselves, your heart is right. 
in holiness, having their conduct match the way a godly woman should act. Just like that verse said, which becometh women professing, which becometh women professing godliness. And it says sobriety. And that's just not staying away from alcohol, but temperance and everything else as well. Now, chapter 3. Now, we come to one of the most controversial chapters in Paul's epistles. And this chapter is about the qualifications for holding an office in a local church. Now, 1 Timothy 3, 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So, if a man desires to be a pastor, he desires a good thing. And these are ideal qualifications for a pastor. And I say that because... The only person who could completely have all these traits 100% of the time is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you think that you have all these traits 100% of the time, I don't know about you. I've heard sermons where a guy would preach through this, and by the time it was over, he had disqualified every man in the world from being a pastor, including himself. He just didn't know that he disqualified himself. I'm sure he, he knew that he disqualified everybody else, but he didn't know he disqualified himself as well by saying that a man must meet every single one of these qualifications 100% of the time. You're just not going to do it. But it says a bishop then must be blameless. And notice that it says must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now, blameless doesn't mean sinless. Paul said he was, according to the law, blameless back before he was saved. Now, this doesn't mean he kept the law perfectly because nobody did, obviously. It, it just means he, he strived to keep it, and then if he broke it, he offered the prescribed sacrifice for that. If a man is blameless today, he's going to be striving to do what's right and then confess his sin when he doesn't do what's right to stay in fellowship. And then right his wrongs with others as well. But he's not going to be blameless 100% of the time. So are you just going to disqualify him in the moments that he's not? Now here's a big one for most people. The biggest one for most people is a bishop then must be blameless the husband of one wife. Now see, when somebody's looking for a pastor, they will say, I'm, I'm okay with him as long as he's the husband of one wife. One time a guy was talking to me and he said, I'm, I'll take any pastor. I don't care how he preaches. I don't care how he teaches. I don't care about any of that as long as he's the husband of one wife. And it's just foolishness. Uh, the teaching, and this is the way they believe, the teaching is that if a man has been divorced and remarried, then he has two living wives if his first wife is still alive. So they say he has two wives and is no longer the husband of one wife. But this isn't true. If a man's wife leaves him and refuses to be his wife any longer... She joins flesh with another man and gives him divorce papers. They are divorced physically and legally. She's no longer his wife. Pretty much what you're saying is God does not recognize the divorce. She's just still his wife even though they've been divorced. But that doesn't make any sense. How can he be the husband of two wives if his first wife divorced him, physically joined flesh with another man, and gave him divorce papers as well. Think, for example, of a divorced person that you know. Right now, think, for example, of a divorced person. If that person has been remarried, do you believe that their first spouse is still their husband or wife? No, you don't, because that doesn't make any sense. You don't even... You only start thinking this way when you read 1 Timothy 3... And think about what you've been taught all this time. That's the only time you think that way. Like say your best friend has been divorced and he got remarried. When you look at your best friend, you don't think, well, this guy's got two wives. You don't think that way. 
because it's not it doesn't make any sense if a man is a husband of one wife then he's faithful to the wife that he currently has and that's why it says a man a bishop then must be present tense the husband of one wife the fact that he had previous marriages doesn't make him the husband of two wives when you teach that husband of one wife means basically one marriage ceremony throughout his whole life, you run into problems. For example, just think about these examples. Pretend you have a guy named Jim. We'll just say there's a guy named Jim, and Jim lived his entire saved life as a habitual fornicator. Let's say he finally gets right with the Lord. Finally. He gets on fire, finally settles down with a beautiful Christian woman. Everyone would say, you know, if he if he really gets into the Bible and he feels like he wants to be in the ministry, he feels like he, need, he wants to be a pastor, you know, he's living right, he's doing good, he's got the pa his past, everyone would say he's qualified to pastor. And I'm not saying he's not. He may be. His failures and sins can be confessed and he can be right back in fellowship with the Lord just as good as any other man. But they'll say this guy's qualified to pastor who's been with, could have been with 20 women as in the life of a habitual fornicator. That's very common for a man who's like that to be with that many women, if not more. But see, he never tied the knot, as they say, with a woman until he met this Christian woman. So he finally gets married. That's his first marriage ceremony. His first official wife. But at the same time, pretend you have this other man named Jack. So Jim, you got Jim, the habitual fornicator, who had one marriage ceremony, and then you got this man named Jack. Let's just say this guy named Jack, he got saved at a young age, he had never been with a woman all the way through life, all the way through high school and everything. He had never been with a woman. And finally, he meets a woman and gets married. He, he, and he did not even um, sleep with this woman until they made it official. He saved himself for marriage. He loved his wife. And out of nowhere, she decides that she wants to leave him. She's found somebody else. Uh, he, he had no idea this would happen. You know, sometimes people change after you get married. And he had no idea she would do this. She, it, it broke his heart. And he tried every way to get her to come back. But she divorces him. And so that he doesn't have to burn in his lust the rest of his life, he gets remarried. Tries to do things right. He doesn't just want to go around and fulfill his lust with different women. He wants to get remarried, get a new wife. So this will be the only the second woman that he's been with, but it will also be the second marriage ceremony. So they say that Jack here, if say that Jack wants to be a pastor, say that he uh, he he wants to get in the ministry, he wants to be a pastor. They're going to say, no, no, Jack. You've, been, you've had two marriage ceremonies. So they say he's disqualified because according to them, he is not the husband of one wife. That makes absolutely zero sense. You see, while Jim back there, remember Jim, he had been with maybe 20 plus women. And the thing is, he just had one marriage ceremony with one of them. Out of all those 20 plus women, he just had one marriage ceremony. They believe he's the husband of one wife because he's got one marriage ceremony. And the poor guy, Jack, whose wife left him, they believe he's not qualified because he's had two marriage ceremonies. Think about it. When it comes to the, the sins we're talking about here, Jack did nothing wrong. Jack saved himself for marriage. Uh, Jack did not want the divorce. She gave him the divorce. 
Jack just didn't want to live the rest of his life in burning in lust. And it's not his fault his wife left him. Jim lived his life as a habitual fornicator. Finally gets right with the Lord and gets married. Only has one marriage ceremony. Jack has two. They say Jim's qualified and Jack is not. That makes zero sense. It's because they believe a man can only have one marriage ceremony. And if he's had more than one, then that means he's got more than one wife. And I'm not saying either one of these guys, Jim or Jack, are disqualified. Because they're both the husband of one wife. Jim has one wife. Jack has one wife, according to the way I believe. They believe Jack has two because his the wife that divorced him is still alive and he got remarried. They believe pretty much what they believe is if you're divorced you're still married, which makes no sense. But you see, Jack had the tough break in that his wife left him. Jim didn't have the tough break in the, in that his wife didn't leave him. I just don't see how a man is disqualified over a tough break. And it doesn't mean he didn't rule his own house well either. That's what you hear. They say, if your wife leaves you, then you didn't rule your own house well. And that just sounds so uh, stupid. And if, if you go around saying stuff like that, you better watch it. Because the devil might send a legion to get in your wife for a little bit. Basically, what I believe is that if a man is divorced from a woman. She's no longer his wife. So then if he remarried, he simply has one wife, not two. But see, what they believe is, if you, if you, if your wife leaves you, she divorces you, and you get remarried, that you have two wives and you're no longer the husband of one wife. Or they believe that you've, you've, or since you've been married twice, that you're no longer the husband of one wife. He's the, he's the guy I gave the example of is the husband of one wife. His first wife divorced him. God recognizes the divorce. And then they'll say, well, God hates divorce. Who said he didn't hate divorce? Are we arguing over does God love divorce or hate divorce? Or are we talking about what does the husband of one wife mean? See, one time a guy asked me these questions... And uh, he starts getting mad at me saying that God hates divorce. Who said God didn't hate divorce? I didn't, I'm not arguing that God likes divorce or not. We're talking about what does the husband and one wife mean. And then you, you get to talking with this about somebody. Anytime that I've ever talked to, about this subject with somebody, well, they, they after I show them the common sense about it and Bible verses about it, they say, well, I've just always believed. Well, yeah, you have just always believed it. But just because you've always believed it doesn't make it right. And just because you've always believed it doesn't mean you have to keep teaching it and keep believing it, even though you've been shown what's right about it and what's wrong about it, what you're teaching. See, that's what makes a Bible believer. Are you going to keep teaching something because uh, you've always believed it and it's your tradition and all your buddies will not like you anymore if you uh, start teaching the right way. You, see, if you're a Bible believer, you will follow the Bible. And if, the, if, if something in the Bible crosses what you believe, you'll quit believing what you believe and start believing the right way. But see, another problem they get into is they're going around teaching that husband and one wife means one marriage ceremony. But then they cross themselves. Let's say that, let's go back and look at Jim and Jack. Now remember Jim lived a life as a habitual fornicator. Joined flesh with 20 plus women. Finally he gets right with the Lord. And he desires the office of a bishop. He wants to be a pastor. He, he's married now to a good Christian woman. He's only had one marriage ceremony. Let's just say that he grows he grows older, his wife grows over older, and Jim's wife passes away. She dies. 
let's say that he wants to get he gets lonely he wants to get married again so he gets married again this will now be his second marriage ceremony so now jim's had two marriage ceremonies but they don't disqualify him because they say since his first wife died okay that's you that when you do that you're just you're only counting one of the one of the just one of the grounds for divorce and remarriage which is death you know there's more than one grounds for divorce in the bible you got death if your spouse dies it's not a sin for you to remarry if she commits fornication divorce and remarriage is not a sin and if she deserts you divorce and remarriage is not a sin and when you when you only count the one that's not being complete but see they cross themselves they say that they pretty much are, are telling us that husband and one wife means one marriage ceremony but now jim has two marriage ceremonies his first wife dies he gets remarried that's two marriage ceremonies what is he still qualified well yeah of course there was no sin that took place i mean it's just life your spouse can die and if you don't want to live the rest of your life alone you get remarried would that disqualify somebody from being a pastor no that's stupid now jim has just as many marriage ceremonies as jack jim is still qualified according to them jack is not it just it makes no sense to me the way people interpret the husband and one wife if a man has been divorced physically legally all the way around divorced i mean he's divorced that woman is no longer his wife he's not the husband of two wives and then another way you can look at this is back when paul wrote this it was not even uh, um, uncommon for a man to have multiple wives in the uh, in the apostolic age it was not uncommon for a man to have more than one wife i mean the main characters in the bible had more than one wife i mean david had more than one wife abraham jacob um solomon these, these guys had tons of wives Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. It's not far-fetched at all to say that's why Paul wrote it because, you know, he's not wanting somebody that's got more than one wife. And it's it's about staying faithful to the one wife you have. I mean, if you're, if you're wanting to be a pastor and you can't even uh, be faithful to your wife, you're stepping out on your wife, joining flesh with all these other women it, it says paul said you know if you join if you lay with a harlot you too will be one flesh that's a physical marriage right there when you step out on your wife and you're not faithful to your wife i don't consider that the husband of one wife anymore you physically joined flesh with another woman physically you became one flesh with her so husband and one wife is about being to, faithful to the one wife you have not taking other wives and not stepping out on your wife now if a man has problems with that he does not need to be a pastor but for somebody like jack that we gave the example of his wife divorced him he had a tough break and he got remarried. That does not disqualify him from being a pastor. And if you say it is, that's completely stupid. Because there was no sin on his part whatsoever. And he is the husband of one wife. His first wife divorced him. Now you can continue teaching this. And I've showed in many other videos as well. That that's completely wrong. And if you've listened, you know that that's wrong. You just want to keep teaching it. And a lot of people say, you know, I've just got convictions about it. You may have convictions about it. 
But that don't mean that you can push that as that as the doctrinal truth just because it's your conviction. Now, if somebody just doesn't want somebody that's had two wives before, then I completely respect that. That's fine. But at the same time, if you're going to say, you know, well, she's, well, this guy's okay, but he's had two wives, but the other one's died, and that's why he's had more than one wife. You, you, you don't want to become kind of double-minded about it. You see, you get into a lot of problems when you teach that the husband and one wife means one marriage ceremony. But that's the biggest one. That's the big one. And people get very, very angry about it. If it's the truth that you're teaching, then why, why are you getting angry? Why are you getting so angry about it? But it says in verse 3, Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. So back to people saying, you know, that you got to have all these 100% of the time. All these all these traits, you got to have them 100% of the time. You don't have all these 100% of the time. A lot of these are easy. I mean, not giving to wine, that's easy. No striker, that that's easy most of the time for a lot of people. But patient... Being patient, are you always a patient 100% of the time? Covetous? Uh, do you not covet things sometimes? I think you do. Not greedy of filthy lucre? Mm, you, you, there's good pastors that could have problems with that sometimes. Those are all things that a man should could could have creep into his life at one moment or another. For example, if you trim your message, cut corners on your message because you're afraid a lot of people in the church will quit giving you money, are you not greedy there? Um, but do I believe that automatically disqualifies him and that he should resign? Absolutely not because he's not going to meet the qualifications 100% of the time. He's not Jesus Christ. These are ideal qualifications for a pastor. But I kid you not, I heard an evangelist say that if a pastor's wife has short hair, that he needs to resign. Isn't that stupid? It's funny how these self-righteous Pharisees will put sometimes even more qualifications on the pastor's wife than they do on the pastor himself sometimes. The man's wife, you got to think like this. The man's wife is still an adult. And when it comes right down to it, she's going to do what she wants to do. And if she wants to be a good wife, then she will. If she wants to be a rebellious wife, then she will. And a lot of these self-righteous Pharisees, like that evangelist, they act as if they have so much control of their wife, as if their their wife is literally afraid of them. And if you have to... Uh, scare or threaten your wife to do right, then it really isn't her being in submission to you. You're just holding her hostage. She's probably praying for you to die. I mean, it comes down to this. A man needs to try his best to do right. And his wife needs to try her best to do right. And if they both do that, then they will treat each other right. And if they both do that, then they're not going to get a divorce. She knows her role and he knows his role. Her role is not to have authority over the man. And if she does have authority over the man, she messes up the picture of Christ and his bride. Verse 4, it says, One that ruleth well his own house, having children in subjection with all gravity. So if you have five kids, then one of them is bound to make a mess out of things and make you look bad. And I've heard several pastors condemn other pastors because their kid went down the wrong road. And they say, well, this man, look at his child. He is not qualified to be a pastor. He does not rule his own house well. But fast forward a few years later, and then their kid went down the wrong road themselves. They condemned this pastor in the past because their kid went down the wrong road. 
Fast forward a few years later, their kid goes down the wrong road. Are they disqualified? You see, this one pastor badmouthed and condemned another pastor because of one of his adult children who was like 50 or 60 years old committed a murder. And he used that to say that this pastor was disqualified because there's no way that he rules his own house well if his son commits a murder. That doesn't make any sense. For one thing, that son that committed that murder was like 50 or 60 years old. He had been out of the house for years. And when you have so many kids, you're bound to have a, one, a bad apple in the bunch. But a few years later, after that guy condemned this pastor... This same self-righteous Pharisee of a pastor got hit where it hurt. One of his kids was sending filthy text messages and pictures to an underage girl in the church. Do I think this disqualifies him from pastoring? No, because you're going to have bad apples. I mean, Jesus had a bad apple, and he is Judas. Kids are going to be kids. And I know this pastor was raising his kids right. It's just that the devil gets in there sometimes. And see, I'm very unbiased on all this stuff I'm saying. For one thing, I am the husband of one wife. I was not with another woman before I was married. I was not with another woman after I was married. I've been with one woman. I've been married to one woman. So why would I um, teach what I'm teaching? You know, it's not benefiting me any. I'm just teaching it because I believe it's the truth. Now, I've not had a kid that's gone south. My kids are both young. They're both very young. They could go south. And I, I pray that they don't. But I'm not biased on what I'm teaching here. It's not benefiting me at all. It's actually not benefiting me when it comes to men because, you know, men hear this, they think, well, this guy, he's a false teacher. He he doesn't, he believes that a, a divorced and remarried man can pastor or deacon. All right. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, there's some men uh, at church that would make much better deacons, but they can't be deacons because they've been divorced and remarried. I know people like that personally. That I, I this, like you got some of the most spiritual men in church have been divorced and remarried, but they're not a deacon because they believe that since they had a previous wife that, they, that they're disqualified, even though he's probably the most spiritual man in the church many times, not every time, but many times. And I, I've seen, I mean, I've not been saved long. I've not been in church that long, but I've seen where uh, a pastor's kid will go the wrong way and then they say, well, he's disqualified. And I've even heard of pastors who stepped down from being a pastor because one of their kids went down the wrong way. I mean, if you live right in front of your kids, you try your best to teach them right and do right by them. If they grow up and make a mess of things, that's on them. They still have a free will. And when it comes right down to it, people are going to do what they want to do. I mean, there was no sin on your part. You did what you were supposed to do. But people has got all these things they will, that they want to use to say that you're not qualified to pastor. But half the time, it ain't even true. But when you pick a pastor, these are the ideal qualifications. But you're not going to find a pastor who meets all the qualifications 100% of the time. And if they don't, meet the qualifications 100% of the time, then you can't disqualify him over the fact that he's been divorced and remarried. If, you know, I mean, if the guy, I mean, think about it like this. If the guy has a good wife and he just up and decides to divorce his wife for absolutely no reason and marry somebody else, obviously, that guy should step down. That's disgusting. I mean, he's, that's, that's wrong. I mean, we have a balance here. But I mean, if, the, if there was no sin on his part, his wife just up and left him. And he tried his best to reconcile it. 
You know, there's no sin on his part. I believe he's still qualified to be a pastor. So it says in 1 Timothy 3, 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? You know, if a man doesn't even see to it that his kids are doing right and making a true effort to see his kids and that his kids and wife are doing right, then how is he going to have care over the church? But this doesn't mean you can disqualify the pastor because he had a bad apple in his house. 1 Timothy 3, 6, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. A novice is someone who's new. For example, it isn't ideal to have a brand new baby Christian to be your pastor. Or a Christian who's been saved a while but has the Bible IQ of a brand new baby Christian. Once they start learning things, they can get lifted up in pride because of their knowledge. You see, when you first start learning stuff in the Bible, uh, it's a temptation to start thinking you know better than everybody else. Uh, or the position of the pastor itself could get to their head and, and pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. 1 Timothy 3, 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them that out which are without, lest he fall into repro reproach and snare of the devil. A good report of them that are without, the lost people outside of the church. Now, you can go too far with this, because a man who's living right will be falsely accused and everything else, and if you have a good pastor, people are going to say bad stuff about him that they don't like about him. For example, I hear people say bad stuff about my pastor. He's too loud. He's too rough. He's stuff like that. You know that that doesn't count. You know you don't. You know if your pastor is going around doing all this dishonest criminal stuff and everybody in town knows it. You know that's not that's not good. That's not that's that's what this is talking about. For the most part, if he has a good report, he's showing up. You know this is a man. He shows up for work. He's being honest in his dealings with people in the lost world, being good to people. He's going to have a good report, even if they think he's a fanatic, even if they think he's overboard, even if he gets all in their nerves, constantly talking about the Bible. He's still going to have a good report. You know, my pastor, he, he has a good report. You know, the lost people know that he's a good man. They know that he is in that position that he's in for a reason, even if they don't like some of the stuff that he does. Just because, you know, they're, they're lost sinners and they don't like what the Bible says about them. But now Paul's going to nail it down in Timothy's mind that Jesus Christ is God. You see, he's not just practical with stuff. He's also giving him doctrine. In 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. This is one of the greatest verses in the Bible to show you that Jesus Christ is Almighty God. And the new versions will take out the word God and replace it with He. That's a subtle attack on the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. God manifest in the flesh. Now chapter 4 says in 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Paul is letting Timothy know that basically if he preaches good and straight, then most likely he's not going to have a huge crowd. Men are wanting to give heed to doctrines of devils, seducing spirits. They don't want to give heed to sound doctrine. He says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Watch out for those who forbid to marry. For example, the Catholics in their vows of celibacy, they, you know, they forbid certain people to be married, to be in that position. Or, for example, I know of a lot of Baptist pastors who say uh, to take a young man back on this marriage thing again, say a young man who's 21 years old, say his wife leaves him, 
there's no sin on his part whatsoever. Yet they say that he's not, he cannot get married again until his wife dies. I mean, his wife could outlive him, live to be 100 years old. So he's supposed to go from the ages of 21 to 80 without getting married again because his wife is still alive. Because they they say if he's if he gets if he gets remarried, he commits adultery. No, he doesn't. She left him. There was no sin on his part. But that's they forbid him to marry. They say if he if he gets married, he's sinning. That's crazy. And that the Bible calls that a doctrine of a devil. They would rather this 21 year old man, who uh, did not want the divorce, they believe if he gets remarried, then he's committing adultery. So they want him. They they think it's a better idea for him to live in his lust, the rest of his life. Imagine being a 21 year old male in 2022, and you desire to be married because one of the reasons that you get married is so that you don't burn in your lust paul said it's better to marry than to burn they they think it's a better idea for him to just burn in lust than to get married but watch out for those who forbid to marry watch out for those who command you to abstain from meats in colossians 2 16 it says let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, or the new moons, or of the Sabbath days. It says, let no man judge you in meat. Let no man judge you in meats. Because in 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, it says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. If you can give thanks for your ham, and your sausage, and your roast beef, and your steak, and your hamburgers, then you can eat it. It says, For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Then he says in verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Seventh-day Adventism. That's an old wives' fable. It was started by uh, an, an old nasty wife. He says in verse 8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So Paul had to remind Timothy that, that exercising himself spiritually with the book is more profitable than bodily exercise. Now chapter 5, he says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. Most times people only see the first part of the verse. You know, everybody says respect your elders. But a lot of older guys don't treat the young guys right either. It says treat the younger men as brethren. Also treat them with respect. It says treat the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. If you treated all the older women in your life as a mother and all the younger women in your life as sisters, there would be a lot less impurity going on. You wouldn't see them as potential prospects anymore. It says in 5, 8, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Paul is showing Timothy that a man should be a man and provide for his own house, and the responsibility to, to provide for the home falls on the man. A man that doesn't have enough compassion and care for his family, enough to work for their food, is worse than a lost man, an infidel, that is, an unbeliever. Because I know lost men that have enough decency to provide for their own family, so if you're a Christian man who won't work and provide for your family, then you're just as sorry as a lost person. I mean, if you can't work, that's different. That's one thing. But if you can and you won't, that's another thing. 5.13, And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. People who won't work have more time to get into trouble. They have more time to be busybodies. And when you work and provide for your family, it takes a lot of your time. And then when you're not at work, you'll be too tired to wander around. If you're working all day, you're going to be too tired to wander around from house to house, getting into trouble and being a busybody. And he says in 1 Timothy 5.23, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. This is every drunk's favorite bible verse but obviously there's two kinds of wine in the bible old wine and new wine new wine is just grape juice you know 
you, you can look it up. A lot of people drink grape juice today for stomach problems. Uh, I know, I know of this. Some people that they every day they drink grape juice because they believe it keeps them from getting a stomach bug. I don't believe Paul is telling Timothy to drink alcoholic wine when he just, when when one of the qualifications that Paul gives is not given to wine. And uh all through the Bible, wine alcoholic wine is in a negative light. Now chapter 6, Paul is going to instruct Timothy on being content. He needs to be content with where he is who he's pastoring, and who his flock is, and what he currently possesses. It says in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. If you're living godly, and you're also content with what God has given you as your portion in this life, that's true happiness. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. You might as well not even worry about the temporal things of this life, because you can't take it with you anyways. Paul says in verse 8, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. If you have food and you got clothes, then you have enough to get by every day. Verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. You think that being rich is the greatest thing that could happen, but it actually just leads to more temptations in your life. The more power you have, the more temptation that there is to sin. And the more sin you can get into. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after. They have erred from the faith. And pierced themselves through. With many sorrows. You got all these pastors that get greedy of filthy lucre. And then they err from the faith. They just pierce themselves through with many sorrows. They fall into temptation and a snare. Into many foolish and hurtful lusts. They start trimming the message, cutting parts of the message off so that it doesn't stop the money from coming in. Because if they're negative or preach on a certain sin that somebody might be doing in their church, they think, well, that person is going to stop coming and giving all this money so I can't say this and I can't say that and I can't do this and I can't do that and I have to say this and I have to say this. They're ba they base everything that they say off, is this person going to keep coming and giving money? You know, that's, since this is a pastoral epistle, and it can be a temptation for pastors to cut the message so that the money stays coming in, Paul is giving these instructions to Timothy. Don't worry about being rich, because... You're just going to fall into temptation and a snare. You can't take none of this material stuff with you anyway. He says you brought nothing in and you can't take nothing out. But this has been the first pastoral epistle, First Timothy.